Uh, I have a short, uh, short uh, 20 minutes or so to report to you on a different topic, the survey of uh, student library use that we administered last spring. Um, so this is, in a sense, part of uh, the acts of consultation that Neil is uh, talking about. Let me start by suggesting the hunches and hypotheses that we had going into this survey and then present you with the basic results. Faculty reported taking up the various new electronic services with avidity. So the message was rather contradictory, and one suspected that it was being driven by faculty fears of the possibility of off-site shelving after having heard horror stories from peers at other institutions. Now, during the debate over the uh, automated storage and retrieval facility, I tried to pin these feelings down by looking at available utilization data, the turnstile and circulation information. Now, the turnstile information over the last four years produced a dramatic fact. Over the four-year period, 2000 to 2004, aggregate undergraduate entries to Regenstein were up 40%, while faculty entries were down 20%. Part of the undergraduate rise was demographic, to be sure. It derived from college expansion. But the undergraduate entry rate was up nearly a third, even controlling for demographic expansion. Faculty size, however, had not changed, so the faculty decline in entries was real. But when I looked at circulation, the effect was reversed. Over the same period, undergraduate circulation rates had declined slightly, while faculty circulation was up almost 70%. So undergraduates were entering Regenstein considerably more, but taking out slightly fewer books, while faculty were entering it considerably less, but taking out vastly more books. There were two obvious interpretations of the faculty behavior change. One was the pull of doing bibliographic work in the office and sending an RA over to get the books. With new electronic resources, more materials could be located ahead of time, and visits could be made fewer because they were more efficient. The other possible factor was the push of a building filled with students eating lunch and making cell phone calls, a building whose entry pattern looked suspiciously like that of a student union. The noise of the Regenstein main reference area made it largely useless as a scholarly space, and undergraduate use seemed an obvious culprit in pushing faculty out. These early and quite speculative investigations made it clear that we needed a serious portrait of student use in Regenstein. Although it could not be retrospective, we could at least make it detailed enough to replace vague faculty opinion with focused analysis. So I report here on that survey. The faculty side of the story must await another day, although I will tell you that there's not much support for the RA theory. Uh, there, there aren't uh, that many faculty with the RA's uh, authorized borrowers coming over here. Faculty must be coming over on their own and simply carting out all the books or carting them up to their studies by themselves. Since the task force was not appointed until mid-April, we had very little time to design and field the student survey. The University Survey Lab did superb work, and we designed, pre-tested, and fielded an excellent and extensive survey in two and a half weeks flat. We were in the field from 6 May to 3 June when we closed the website, chose the random numbers, and awarded the 10 incentive prizes, one of $500 and the others of 50. We invited 14,000 participants, which comprised all the university's registered students under the broadest definition. Overall response is about 42%. It was higher in the groups which turnstile evidence tells us are the major users of Regenstein, undergraduates and humanities and social sciences graduate students. Indeed, a substantial proportion of the universe of 14,000 registrants are downtown business students who never expect to use the library. So the effective response rate the response among students resident or active in Hyde Park is probably somewhat over 50%. As is usual in survey work, there was a slight but not problematic over-response from women. More worrisome was the possibility that we had an over-response from heavy library users. However, we've investigated that issue in some detail, and although there is some over-response, it's not as large as we feared. Nearly a quarter of our respondents, for example, did not take a book out of the library last year. So while our final report will give circulation-weighted figures for the important populations, it's unlikely that the general trends will be different from those we observe in the respondent group. So the respondent group is the basis of what I'm going to talk about today. Of the 5,700 respondents, about two-thirds noted Regenstein as their most used library. Another 10% reported Karar, 10% reported no favorite at all, and the rest were scattered around the system. 
Among those who did have favorite libraries, however, there's a group of about 15 to 20 percent of respondents who said they spent less than 10 hours in their most used library in the entire spring quarter. Note that this means that about a quarter of all respondents basically had no real connection with the library system as a physical entity, although of course they may have used library licensed electronic sources remotely. Indeed, if we push beyond the rather low 10-hour standard and ask how many respondents treated Regenstein as their primary study space, only about 1,200 said yes. A little over half of these are undergraduates, a little over a third divinity, social sciences, and humanities graduate students, and the rest scattered. Given our response rates, this suggests that the primary study space clientele for Regenstein overall is probably between 1,500 and 2,000 students. And that includes considerably less than half the college's undergraduates. So under the admittedly lax 10-hour criterion, though, we have about 2,600 respondents for whom Regenstein is their most used library, whether it's their principal study space or not. Nearly all the findings I discussed today are based on this group of 2,600 users. We asked these students dozens and dozens of things about their usage of the library, their desiderata for the library, their demographics, and so on. It's astounding, in fact, that we got as many completed surveys as we did. The main usage questions comprised 41 different things. We asked whether respondents did these things never, sometimes, about half of their visits, most of their visits, or all visits, so five-point scales. After much preliminary and factor analysis, we group these items into a number of major scales. The first five of them are direct measures of library usage per se. One is a traditional research scale that combines items like checking out a book, browsing the shelves, using printed library material without checking it out, using the online catalog, and so on. A second pair of scales tapped electronic use. One of these is a single item on the use of online databases. The second pulled together use of various other electronic sources, the RLG online catalog, WorldCat, online reference, online bibliographical search engines, library subject guides, and so on. Still another scale, using a slightly relaxed metric, tapped use of important special resources, special collections, archives, microforms, CD-ROM databases. And a fifth measure of direct use was circulation, which we simply crosswalked in from the actual circulation records. So we have five scales of research usage, a traditional scale, online database use, general electronic source use, special resources, and circulation. These five scales on research library use were complemented by some other scales of more mundane matters. One is a purely social scale, made up of items of meeting new people and hanging out on A-level. A-level is the place where you're currently sitting, and after 10 o'clock at night, it is one of the social centers of this university. <coughs> Um, not a place for adults. <laughs> uh, we also have two scales about work media, one of them bringing together uh, items about wireless use, one of them bringing together use of library computers on assignments. Finally, there's a scale that we originally thought of as an indicator of the sort of student union status of the library. And it's important that I tell you exactly what's in this scale because it bears directly on my my opening question of research use versus student union use. The items in this scale were take a study break, make a cell phone call, answer a cell phone call, arrange to meet a friend, bump into a friend and chat, do email, eat food you've brought into the library, eat food you bought in the library canteen, surf the web, shop on the web. This is all the bad stuff that people like me thought was antithetical to serious use of the library, all lumped together. The first big take-home point of my talk today is that the idea that this scale is just the reverse of serious research use is completely wrong. There is no relation whatever at the individual level between being high or low on this scale and being high or low on the traditional research scale. They're simply measuring different things. One scale is measuring traditional research practices. The other is measuring what for our current students, both graduate and undergraduate, is a particular way of doing everyday life. Choosing to arrange your everyday life in this fairly technologized and somewhat sociable way is quite simply unrelated to whether or not you're a strong or weak user of traditional research practices. There is, in particular, no big difference between graduates and undergraduates on this scale. I'm going to henceforth call this, by the way, the everyday life scale, because that's really what it's measuring, a way of doing everyday life. So the faculty model of union versus research facility, student union versus research facility, is pretty much wrong. 
There is a negative relation between the purely social scale, the A-level scale, as we call it, and traditional research practices. But the A-level social side of the library is essentially an evening affair when, as we know from turnstile data, the faculty and even the graduate students are simply not around. So to the extent the place is a student union, it's a union at a time that doesn't interfere with the research aspect of the facility during the day. So that's big point number one. Patterns of everyday life arrangements are orthogonal to research practices and, so far as we can tell, the union versus research model is wrong. The story about the other non-research scales is pretty quickly told. About two-thirds of the students have wireless capability and those who have it use it, whether they're graduates or undergraduates. As for the use of library computers for assignments, this is much more characteristic of undergraduates than of graduates. And it makes most sense to look at this particular figure in the context of two other figures. The first is a single item that didn't fit into any scale, but that we quickly figured out was very important. That's whether a respondent brought materials of his or her own into the library to work with. This figure is also much higher for undergraduates than for graduates. The second related figure is the traditional research scale, which conversely is much higher for graduates than for undergraduates. When we put all these three facts together, we can see they make a single consistent point. Undergraduates are more likely to come to the library bringing their own materials, and they're more likely to use library computers to do their assignments. Graduate students, by contrast, are more likely to come to do research using materials found in the library. I hesitate to underscore this contrast for fear of making everybody think once again that sociology is the science of demonstrating the obvious. But it's essential to know such things firmly and on the basis of real evidence, not hearsay. So my te second take home point is this. Undergraduates predominantly use Regenstein as a study hall, bringing material there and doing assignments there. Graduate students use it predominantly as a research site. This is not an absolute separation by any means, but as we shall see, it runs throughout this data. An important footnote to this fact is that the undergraduate pattern is driven to a large extent by the curriculum of the college. The core and much of the upper level teaching here emphasize careful analysis of a small number of selected texts. These texts are usually purchased books that students are expected to read intensively. Thus, when we break down the undergraduate scales by year in the college, we can see that all of the research scales, traditional research, both of the electronic scales, circulation, even special sources, take a jump from the first year to the second year, and then a somewhat bigger jump from the third year to the fourth year as the honors students start to write BA papers and finally have to ding into the library as a research place. So undergraduates move somewhat from the study hall model to the research model as they grow out of that portion of the curriculum that is most organized around the close reading of texts, that is the core, which they tend to do early in their careers. But overall, my point is that given the curriculum, we should not be surprised by the pattern that undergraduate study hall versus graduate research site. So the second big point is that for undergraduates, Regenstein's primarily a study hall, not a union, although the latter usage breaks out a bit around the edges. For graduates, by contrast, it's predominantly a research facility, although the earlier stage graduate students clearly do follow the undergraduate pattern of bringing materials in and using Regenstein as a study hall. I can move from my, this difference to my third big point by noting that the undergraduates are higher than, that the graduates are higher than the undergraduates on all five types of research scale. For example, they're a full point higher on the traditional research scale. Remember, this means they average a point higher on each of the eight items in that scale. And a point higher means the difference between sometimes and about half the time, or between usually and always. So it's a big difference. It's consistent across items. What I'm telling you now, however, is that this large difference also holds up for circulation levels, for use of specialized resources like special collections and microforms, and most important, it also holds up for the two electronic indicators, both the online database item and the composite scale of other online resources. Even though the undergrads are much higher on online databases than on any other research indicator, the graduate students are higher still. And the electronic indicator figures hold up not just for Regenstein users, but for all 5,700 respondents in the data set. Because, of course, we ask respondents to answer the suite of electronic questions without reference to any physical library. So the big fact here is that graduate students are higher on all research scales, and this includes the two electronic scales. 
Now, it should be borne in mind that the graduate student respondents are on average eight to 10 years older than the college respondents. Graduate students have gotten older since I was a graduate student. We were all kids. So we can say that there is no evidence here of a cohort effect. That is, there's no sign that the younger people are somehow more electronic, because we've got a 10-year difference almost between grads and undergrads, and it's the grads who are more electronic, the older ones. And bear in mind that we've already seen that there's no big difference between graduates and undergraduates on average in terms of whether they conduct their everyday life electronically. So there's absolutely no evidence whatever in this data that there's a general succession of lifestyles or research styles from traditional to electronic going on. There's no evidence of a, of a time, an overtime change in, in cohort behavior. In the area of research proper, we can see this even more starkly by looking at the correlations between our two main research scales, the traditional materials research scale and the general electronic source scale. These two scales correlate very strongly at the individual level with a value of plus 0.48. This means that the more an individual uses books, the more he or she uses electronic resources and vice versa. Now to me, this seems like very strong evidence in favor of what we may call the synergy hypothesis, the hypothesis that the two types of materials tend to reinforce each other's use. But even if we choose to regard that positive finding skeptically, we have to accept the negative finding that's implied here, which is that there's no evidence whatever in this data for a replacement of traditional research practices by electronic ones, right down to the level of individuals. The replacement hypothesis really has to be rejected. So that's my third big point. There's no evidence for replacement of physical materials by electronic ones, either in the implicit cohort test that's provided by grads versus undergrads, nor in the explicit individual level test that's provided by the individual level correlation. But if we refer to the library's data for hits on licensed electronic databases, we can see the one grain of truth to the mountain of falsehood in the replacement hypothesis. The main electronic workhorses, accounting for the vast majority of total hits, are JSTOR and Elsevier Science Direct, which are basically direct, direct physical delivery systems for journals. All they do is provide a low-cost way to get physical copies of journal articles. And we know that people make physical copies, by the way, because more than half of all JSTOR hits result in a printing. That's national data. At least in the humanities and social sciences, scholars and students do not read articles on a screen. So the main replacement that we actually do see in the usage figures themselves involves only one particular type of material, and that only in the final delivery stage. So far, I've made three major points. First, that the electronic sociable way of conducting everyday life does not correlate positively or negatively with use of the research use of the library. Second, that undergraduates use the building chiefly as a study hall, especially early in their careers, while graduates use it chiefly for research. And third, that electronic research practices and traditional physical ones are complementary rather than antagonistic. These three points I regard as established beyond question by the survey data. I'd like to close with some remarks about those uh, whom we might call the heavy users of the library. The provost directed the task force to facilitate the research enterprise. Well, who really are the constituents of that enterprise? I've so far talked a lot about undergraduates and graduates as groups. Let's try to dig beneath those categories and figure out who the heavy users are, their student level irrespective. Now, gross circulation figures give us some sense of these people. The library has about 13,600 users a year in the sense of people who took at least one book out. Looked at, looking at the statistics for 2003-04, I found out last year that about 10% of those users provide 50% of the circulation. And at the other end of the scale, the lowest 50% of the users provide only 10% of the circulation. And bear in mind that this ignores users who didn't take any book out at all, which would include one quarter of U of C undergraduates last year. Basically, the heavy users of the library in circulation terms are the approximately 1,000 people, 7% of the total, who take out more than 100 books a year. They provide about 40% of all circulation. This group included 80 faculty, about 400 graduate students, and about 140 undergraduates. In one sense, these 620 people are the heavy users of the library, the constituency the provost has asked us to serve. But our survey allows us a better way to characterize these people, at least those of them who are students. 
We find them in the following way. We take these five-point scales I've been telling you about from never to always, and we lump together the top two categories, usually and always, and we call that heavy use. And we lump together the bottom two categories, never and sometimes, and we call that light use. We leave middle in the middle. For circulation, we defined 100 plus as heavy use and 50 plus, 50 to 100 as medium. So now we have low, medium, and high ratings for each of our five research scales. The traditional research scale, circulation, other resources, electronic databases, and general electronic sources. And we can think about a heavy user as somebody who's high on several of those scales at once. Believe it or not, 13 student respondents were high on all five of these. These are, they're undoubtedly out there somewhere right now. Um, <laughs> Another 56 are high on four out of five for a total of 69. Another 163 are high on at least three, which makes 232 total heavy users. And another 330 are high on at least two, which means 562 heavy users. Now basically, this population is more or less made up the same at whatever level we cut it. It's about six to eight percent divinity school graduate students, about 30 percent social science graduate students, between 40 and 50 percent humanities graduate students, and from about 10 or 12 to 18 percent undergraduates. When you get down to being high on just two of these things, you get up to 18 percent are undergraduates. But for the most part, the heavy user population is at least 80 percent graduate students. Thus, we see that even though their rate of heavy research is quite low, however, the sheer numbers of undergraduates mean that they still make a not insignificant contribution to the heavy user population of the library. But from the library's point of view, the heavy users are overwhelmingly graduate students and, of course, faculty, which in turn means that rethinking the library as a research facility, from physical layout to website to policies, means mainly figuring out what will assist these groups in their work not figuring out how to help undergraduates whose principal use of the library is simply as a large, well-appointed building in which they can study. So my final take-home point is that the heavy user community of the library is overwhelmingly faculty and graduate students, even if undergraduates are not unrepresented in it. But fortunately, many of the things we can do to improve the building's utility for its heavy users can be done without impairing its utility as a study hall for the perhaps 1,000 undergraduate non-heavy users for whom it's their principal place to study. Now, I wish that time uh, allowed me to favor you with some of the tidbits, the depressing news that more students took a nap last year than asked a librarian a question, <laughs> the shocking news that a substantial fraction, I think actually around 20 percent, of all respondents reported eating outside a designated area on most or all of their visits. The amusing news, that 22 honest souls report taking a nap every time they come into Regenstein. <laughs> but those tidbits must await another day. For today, I want you to remember four things. Doing your everyday life electronically and sociably has nothing to do with whether you're a heavy researcher or not. Undergraduates tend to use the place as a study hall, while graduates use it as a research facility. Electronic resources complement rather than replace physical ones. And the heavy user research community is overwhelmingly graduate and surprisingly dominated to a considerable extent by humanities division students. Now, two of these points may have been rather obvious ahead of time, the study hall versus research site one and the heavy users of the graduate students one. But the non-correlation of lifestyles with research practices was a surprise to many of us, including me, and the powerful complementarity of electronics and traditional research practices was really quite unexpected. So I hope you'll agree that it was not all an exercise in demonstrating the obvious. Thanks. Will you ever address, or do you know when you will present to the public the information about the faculty survey? Um, we're, we decided not to do a full-scale survey of the faculty. Um, so, as I said when, when I opened the, the conference, our approach to talking to, our, to the faculty was to talk to colleagues directly, one-on-one, -on -one, and get a sense of, of what's going on. It may be the case that we, it would be uh, good to go on and, and, and do a survey, but I guess we had a sense that it's better to really talk to people and uh, uh, get a sense of what their complaints, issues, worries, these kinds of things are. So there isn't actually a faculty survey. Yeah. When you um, did your student survey, the students who never took a book out of Frankenstein, did yeah. that exclude reserve reading? Um, uh, yeah, yeah, we didn't use the, uh, we didn't, 
the circulation figures that I use here are non-reserve circulation. Yeah. Um, so you did use it for reserve. Yes, and you see, you, you, one of the scales that I haven't told you much about is uh, electronic reserves, which is very heavily used by undergraduates. Very strong. Um, physical reserves is not all that heavily used by undergraduates. Electronic reserves is really carrying the load at this point. Um, but it's also true that uh, there's a, really a great deal of instruction in the University of Chicago rests on, on these big texts that you walk around the library and you see the Iliad and, and uh, the Division of Labor and Society and all these other books that you can't get through this uh, university without reading. Um, they're all owned by the students and heavily underlined and so on. So that in a sense makes us different from a university that did not have a kind of core-based text-focused curriculum like this because we'd be pushing students, probably be pushing students into research use of the library earlier, It's my sense. Yeah. Beyond uh, undergraduate and graduate and faculty, are you interested in attracting scholars from North and South America, from Asia? Just come here and do mm -hmm. serious research. Um, that's that's getting into the uh, the uh, gleam in the eye kind of dream stuff. Um, I think personally, and I'm not speaking as the chair of the task force at this point, but just personally, I think it's virtually inevitable that that will happen. We are one of the only scholarly libraries, uh, university research libraries in the country that's made the decision to, and then has the space to, go with uh, on-site. Uh, storage, keeping the entire collection in one place. I think it's inevitable that we're going to become a place to which scholars want to come from other, uh, other places in the United States and certainly from overseas. I know I've certainly found that uh, I, I have colleagues often coming to visit me from Europe and they come and they sit in my office and kind of look at me and when they first arrive and I keep saying to myself, oh gosh, this isn't like Europe where if I were a senior professor I'd have flunkies who ran around and took care of this person and blah, blah, blah. And they look sort of dissatisfied and then I don't see them again for two months. And they come back and say, oh, I spent a great two months here. I spent the entire time in the library. Every scholar who's ever visited me from Europe, that's what they've done. They've come and actually camped in the library. So I actually think that we need to develop fellowship programs within the library to develop spaces for visitors in the library and to see that this uh, flow of scholars from elsewhere as actually one of the crucial constituencies of this building. I think also you should attract scholars by providing residential quarters for these scholars. Yes, well, <laughs> as, as, as those of you who are students of, I'm sure Neil could show us, many copies of various master plans of the university. I think all of them include a hotel, which, which there's never been any sign of its being built. Uh, it's, it's always inked in there at 60th and Stony, pretty much, but it kind of never happens. Um, sorry, yeah. Um, we have not, we did not survey the alumni, although I can tell you um, from circulation figures that the single person who took out the most books from the University of Chicago uh, library last year was a BA alumnus. Were they returned? <laughs> no, no, that's the faculty, Michael. <laughs> yeah. Um, you said that there was um, there was a, a, if electronic use went up, mm -hmm. then print use didn't go down, mm -hmm. and vice versa. Yeah. Did you look at that across? disciplines like scientific versus humanities or we, 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 we can look at it at the graduate level across discipline because the graduate students are broken up into divisions. Uh, we have not yet put together the undergraduates uh, into divisions. The undergraduate majors are too small with the exception of economics to sort of stand as independent data entities. We'll have to group the undergraduates to see it that way. Um, the, the graduate students are quite an, the, the Graduate students whom I haven't talked about, PSD and BSD, are kind of interesting characters. Um, one of the interesting facts is it turns out no one reads for pleasure in Regenstein <laughs> except those kinds of people. <laughs> so um, uh, it's, it's the physical science. You see a physical scientist or, or a biological scientist in here, and what they're doing is they're reading for pleasure. Uh, Sure. I, was, I was struck by the, um, the finding that 40 to 50 percent of the users are humanities, mm -hmm. uh, either faculty or yeah, graduate students. Does that correlate with the holdings in the, in the library in a significant way? Um, 
it's 40 50 percent of the heavy users particular very particular population um, I don't know whether it correlates with the holdings of the library I've assumed that the real reason for this is that the social sciences are kind of divided into the people who do book uh, journal kinds of stuff and the people who do straight numbers um, and the people who do straight numbers at this point are doing uh, my colleagues for example the colleagues that I have in sociology who are not like me divided down the middle but who are just straight numbers people they're doing all their journals work off JSTOR um, every now and then they need to look at a monograph they're basically never coming here they can do everything they need to do electronically from their offices so I, that's the way I've interpreted that result that the humanists, fewer of the humanists are in that position at this point. One could imagine, you know, 20 years from now, things could look different. But at this point, the humanists seem to be much more dependent on the stuff that is stored here, whereas the social scientists are kind of divided between the people who are and the people who aren't. Yeah, one last I think question. That really um, speaks mm -hmm. to the question I have. You, you mentioned your finding about the complementarity of mm -hmm. electronic resources. Given the uh, mass digitization projects that have recently been announced, do you view that changing rapidly? Or this is a this is a, a cesspool. One's waiting to drive into the question is about <laughs> the question is about uh, given mass digitization, i.e., the G word. Um, uh, what what do I think is going to happen? Um, as those of you on the, the library staff have heard me give this, this speech before. My worry about the, the mass digitizations is that, in fact, they're going to be extremely difficult to index. And so, although they will have the effect of, of enabling scholars at, uh, at universities or places that don't have huge, huge uh, holdings to find particular items that they already know about, they're not going to have a big impact on people who don't know what they're looking for and need to sort of feel their way around because I think the indexing problem is going to be immensely difficult for that. So I, you know, I, this is my feeling about digitization is that there's going to be a great deal of declaring victory. <laughs> what it actually means for scholarship and for the quality of knowledge, I don't know. Yeah. Constantine. Do you have any sense of, um, of a correlation between the, between the ease and the low cost and speed with which it is nowadays made possible Purchase books, uh, used books and new books from the Times Book Exchange and Amazon.com online, and the use of the library to our people on campus. Well, I don't know because um, the faculty are taking out tons more books, um, so it's hard to see. The, it, it, it may be the case that it's all synergistic. The more they can buy, the more they want to take out, and that everything just goes. That just everything, everything increases everything else. Uh, which is not at all the model that m many of us have been working with. Many of us have had this kind of implicit replacement model. Maybe that isn't what happens. It's just you do a little bit of this. I mean, we're, we've all been waiting for the scholarly monograph to disappear, and it looks healthier than ever. I mean, the presses are just churning them out. Um, who knows? So uh, it may just be that, that the whole system is getting more and more active. And there's this, part of that is the fact that publication is becoming a little more like performance. It's sort of, you know. There's just a lot more of it. I think we're, each of us as individual scholars is doing more in a career than our, our predecessors did. Sorry, yeah. I'm curious whether there were any questions on the survey about the services at the library or the approachability of the staff. When we did some national focus groups um, with undergraduates in major metropolitan areas, mm -hmm. we were disappointed to hear comments like they couldn't distinguish between a student assistant and a librarian, or they found the librarians were mean, or they were frowning, <laughs> and didn't want to help them. I'm just curious uh, no, and I, I mean we did. We asked whether they'd ask the librarian a question or not. I think the difficulty is the level that you're talking about, which is we know that the kids don't ask librarians questions. The question is why. Um, and I think that really, I guess I, I could see focus groups as a way of going at it, but I'm not sure I would believe the results I got in focus groups. I think I think this is actually. Especially at a, at a school like this, it's partly about shame. They can't admit to themselves that they don't know something. It's just like my son, for the last four days, has been refusing to talk to his math teacher. He's obviously needed to do it, but it's all about shame. It's got nothing to do with math and the advice that the guy could give him. That, I think, is, is what it's about. Now, who they feel ashamed in front of about 
with respect to this, I don't know. It's, mu it's even more pronounced in graduate students who I think regard it as a real mark of, in a sense, failure on their part if they don't know their own field well enough to know exactly the sources and whatever. So they'll spend a week floundering around looking for something that they could probably find an answer to fairly quickly. On the other hand, you talk to some undergraduates and they say, I asked the librarian and she, you know, she's unable to help me. And I think there the difficulty is, the traditional difficulty with reference librarians is that you have to know a broad range of things because there are a broad range of clients to deal with. And that means that when you've got people who have fairly expert demands, they're going to go through the stuff that you know pretty quickly. Now, we've thought about various ways to, you know, we're thinking about various policy ways to try to get around that. But I think we would have to look at this ethnographically and actually get students in a room without us there to develop a report on this. Um, but it's an interesting question. Yeah. Just last evening, I was reading in a book I took out of the library Good. of a meeting in Canton in July of 1921, a luncheon meeting among businessmen. And uh, they were talking about uh, resources, and they were talking about sending students to MIT to, mm -hmm. to, to get an education. You'd be surprised how many students in China go to MIT mm -hmm. And I want, I want to see students around the world coming to the University of Chicago to become the, the penultimate source of a grand education. And the library will be the undergirding element to support that. Uh -huh. Well, I think uh, many, many others uh, share that feeling. We, the, this is a, we're in a new kind of knowledge environment, I think. And, you know, the, the image of this university in the old days was very much that it was the great place on a hill and it would send out its, its uh, emissaries to enlighten the countryside. I mean, if you read Harper's, much of Harper's uh, sort of Chautauqua uh, side really leans him in that direction. Uh, I think in the new kind of world that exists, you, it's much more networked. Scholars are everywhere, people are everywhere. Students are expecting not just to go to MIT or the UFC, but to go to the UFC for one thing and to the Ecole des Hautes for something else and to LSE for something. What you need to be, in a sense, is a place that people go to on their way around this kind of system. And I think that's, the, in, a, in a sense, the larger, um, the larger, uh, larger way of putting the argument that you've just made. It's not just that we need people to be coming here, we also need our people to be going elsewhere and to be, in a sense, uh, uh, a stop in this sort of larger network of knowledge. I mean, this brings me back to, you know, the key issue is a hotel. <laughs> it's funny, it's funny. That's what we really need. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, just to the comment about uh, surveying um, mm -hmm. services and library yeah. services. Uh, I just wanted to say that in, in 2004, mm -hmm. I participated in the ARL Live Call study, mm -hmm. which surveyed faculty, graduate students, research staff. And um, those results are on the library's webpage. You can take a look at what they are. Uh, some of them clearly support what you've been talking about this morning. Mm -hmm. The highest uh, numbers for uh, interest areas for undergraduates was the library as a physical space, yeah. Uh, yeah. wanting group studies, uh, for graduate students and for others, uh, accuracy in the online catalog, uh, the best records possible there, and of course, more electronic materials, or more materials in electronic format. Yeah, there's no, I think there's, uh, I worry sometimes though, I mean, I, it's very good to have that survey, and the LiveQual survey is, a, is nice, not only because it's there, but also because it gets repeated and gets done again and again, and so you can kind of see change over time, which is, uh, we've done a sort of one shot, you know, we could leave the thing and set it up and do it in a few years and see where people are. But the nice thing about LiveQual is it does give you, give you uh, uh, change over time. It'd be, it's interesting to know, I mean, they, I worry though sometimes about their saying, well, we need more electronic stuff. They're not, if you look at the usage statistics of the electronic resources that are on the, li on the library right now, if you actually look at the hit data, it really is true that we don't need more of them. We need people to use more of the ones we have. Uh, in fact, the usage is incredibly concentrated into a very, very small number of sources. And there are obviously wonderful electronic resources 
reference resources, for example, they really are not being used at all at this point. So it's kind of, it's interesting to me that they, that the thing is that, well, we need more, we need more. What they really need to do is to work harder at uh, finding the things they have. I must say that for me, at least, the, the big conclusion that's coming out of the task force experience is that the real issue is one of teaching the students how to use a library and how to, in fact, how to use information sources generally. They don't actually have the images in their heads that we think they do. They have a very vague image of what knowledge is. They have an extremely ca cavalier notion of what quality knowledge is. Um, <laughs> and if we don't teach them this stuff, it's going to disappear. Um, and so I really view the, the central issue as a faculty issue. This is something the faculty has to become much more self-conscious of. The kids we're getting now at the undergraduate level are kids whose entire experience of the world of knowledge has been basically the internet. Uh, they've at least, we, we did ask, how many libraries have you been in before coming to the University of Chicago? And it, it's exactly 2.5 for all the undergraduates. That's their, their grade and middle school library and their high school library, and half of them moved, so half of them have two high school libraries. So, um, but it's not clear that they really got anything from those libraries, and my guess is they went in those libraries actually to use the computer screens in them. So that, in fact, they don't have an image in their head of the kind of organization of knowledge that's just second nature probably to virtually all of us in this room. And unless we start to teach that or start to deal with them, engage with them in some direct way, it's going to disappear very, very quickly. Yeah. I wanted to ask you two questions. Uh, first, uh, it relates to the use of electronic resources. Uh, my experience is that if you provide, if one provides uh, very effective access to those electronic resources, they tend to get much more intensive use. <laughs> Uh, I wondered if you could comment on the use of the print collections in the libraries at the University of Chicago. Uh, are there large quantities of the collection that have not been circulated? And does that tell us something about student and faculty use of collections? Um, I'm, I'm, you'd have to talk to the circulation uh, while to actually know what's actually gone out the door. Um, I just, that I just don't know. I mean, studies, I think, around yeah. the country have demonstrated that a relatively small percentage of the print collections and many of the major research libraries in the country are actually being used if we measure by Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's, this is always a crucial issue um, because it's what, it's what constitutes use. If, if use constitutes somebody's t checking the book out and taking it out of the building, obviously um, you could get rid of half the books in this building and, and all but 50 to 80 or 100 faculty would think it was fine. On the other hand, those 50 or 80 or 100 fa faculty would move to another university. The reason is that the reason is not so much that uh, I think it's not that they need to take the book out and command it, but very often that bibliographical chains or research leads go through a particular book and then you go on to the next place. This is why those of us who opposed off-site storage were so opposed to it, because if you have these roadblocks, random roadblocks in the middle of, uh, of research trails, each one of them is a day, you just drop it. You're just not going to do it. So that, that's actually a serious problem. So it's, in a sense, it's a kind of use. You're not going to take that book out. You're going to walk to the stacks and pull out you know, the New York Senate report for 1826 and look at the document 32 um, and put it right back. But something you went needed there, and you go on to the next thing. That relates yep. to my second question. Uh, your comments have focused on the use of collections. Could you talk a little bit about the role of, of libraries like Chicago in building a distinctive, uh, special, uh, global collections regardless of use? That is, do we have a role at Chicago and other research university libraries to take responsibility for building uh, the cultural heritage in our library collections regardless if they're going to be used tomorrow? Well, I, I, I just came to talk about a survey. <laughs> that's like, a, that's like, that's like, that's like, that's like everything, everything in the whole, in the whole nine yards. Yes to all of that. Um, uh, uh, the answer is Judy's time. The answer is yes.